This is Megapine. Megapine. M I P. With Masamela Matsumo. Mark Thompson. Megapine. Get woke. Yesterday, the January 6th committee made criminal referrals to the Justice Department against Donald Trump, suggesting he be charged with obstruction of an official proceeding, conspiracy to defraud the United States, three, conspiracy to make a false statement, and four, conspiracy to defraud the United States by assisting, aiding, or comforting those involved in an insurrection. As the January 6th committee has completed its work, we do well to discuss this topic today. In fact, a book entitled The Peaceful Transfer of Power, An Oral History of America's Presidential Transitions. We've not seen a transition like Donald Trump's from Donald Trump to Joe Biden. We are joined by uh, a veteran from the Clinton administration and the Biden administration. In fact, he was involved in the Biden transition. He is currently the brand spanking new dean of AU, this is what we called when we lived in the DMV, American Universities, Kogan School of Business, the author of The Peaceful Transfer of Power, joins us now, David Marchik. David, how are you today? I'm doing great, and it's a privilege to be on your show. Thank you very much. Well, it's a privilege to have you, and and what a a timely discussion. W- were you already looking at this topic before the the foolishness happened? <laughs> you know, I was involved somewhat in the '92 transition when Clinton took office, which was not a great transition. You know, Clinton didn't want to look presumptuous by having a large transition team organized prior to the election. So that his start, I think Clinton was a great president, did a lot of great things for the country, but his start was bumpy, let's say that. And so I was uh, recruited to do to run this project called the Center for Presidential Transition, which is part of the Partnership for Public Service. It's a, it's a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that wants to make government better, more efficient, more effective. And part of making government more effective is having a smooth and peaceful transfer of power, the launch, so to speak. And so when I signed up, I thought it would be a kind of normal, maybe academic, uh, not very stressful process. And boy, did I get it wrong because the transfer of power to Trump to Biden was anything but normal and lack of stress. So, so this was. A, a, a new venture, this Center for Presidential Transition. This was, it was it during this time? It was started in 2008. I got you, okay. Uh, by a fellow named Max Steyer, and it's worked over several presidential cycles, and they needed someone to run it for this cycle. I see. Um, and so I did it, and I worked closely with the Biden team, but also I worked closely with some people in the Trump White House who actually wanted to do the right thing for the country. Is that right? Yep. There were some people that wanted to do the right thing for the country, and we found them, and we tried to help them the best we could, but also they were stymied in many respects, which we can talk about. Well, well yeah, please, I'd I, I, I like to talk about that. Is, are, are these significant names that we know? All right, well, let's talk about the framing of this. So, so Joe Biden runs for office okay. at the time of the worst crises in the United States since 1932. We had a pandemic. We had 11 million Americans out of work, a recession. We had a racial justice reckoning in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. And we had a climate crisis. What we didn't know is we were going to have a political crisis. So a, a smooth and effective transition requires two things. It requires the incoming president or the president-elect to have a good operation plan well in advance, start the work in March or April of the presidential year and recruit a big team. And Biden did that. He had more than a thousand people working on the transition, ready to go the day after the election. It also requires cooperation from the outgoing administration, the handoff. It requires outgoing secretaries of defense to brief the incoming secretary of defense. 
It requires collaboration between the White House and the candidate. That was very challenged. The, let's start with the positive. The positive was there was a fellow in the White House named Chris Liddell. He was the deputy chief of staff, deputy to Mark Meadows. He is, I would call a traditional Republican. Um, he worked for Trump for four years, but he is a corp former corporate executive. He wanted Trump to win, of course, but more than party, more than personality, he cared about the Constitution of the United States, and that required him to facilitate the, a potential Biden administration. So prior to the election, he did a great job. He implemented the law. He uh, prepared everything. He got all the cabinet agencies to, to prepare briefing materials. After the election, Trump put everything on hold. Everything, you know, was in chaos when he denied the outcome of the election. And so we had this period where uh, the formal transition did not begin for over 30 days after the election. You only have 77, 78 days between the election and the inauguration. Every single day is precious. And Chris's work was stymied. Fortunately, he did stay. And after Trump allowed the transition to start, Chris did a really good job. Then we came on January 6th. And I remember... I was working with Chris, with the former White House chief of staff named Josh Bolton. And Chris was so upset at January 6th, he actually called Josh Bolton and was weeping. And this is a tough, grizzled veteran. And he wanted to quit. And Josh and I basically implored him not to quit. We said, you could quit and have a clear conscience and, you know, maybe get a short story about, you know, standing up and quitting over a, a terrible event in history but you can actually help for the next 14 days ensure that we have a, as smooth a transfer of power as possible. And fortunately, Chris stayed and he did help the Biden team. You mentioned Trump finally decided to let the transition go forward. How late in the process would you say that was? It was too late. So uh -huh. a president elect has enormous amount to do in the 77, 78 days. And in this crisis, there literally was life and death on the line because that was a time when the COVID vaccine was developed, but it wasn't distributed. And the Biden team needed to figure out how to get, the, the, get shots in arms. So there was no collaboration, no cooperation for 35, 40 days after Biden won the election. Um, and that hampered the transition. I think it was December 13th or December 14th where... The court cases finally were done, and it was, there was huge pressure from both Democrats and Republicans to get the formal transition going, and Trump basically allowed it to go forward. So Biden had 30 days to do what he should have had, 78 days. Fortunately, the Biden team did a really good job and mitigated a lot of the damage, but there was damage. Um, so here you are in, in this, in this role <laughs> and, uh, 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 director of the center for, uh, of the center for president transition. So I just have to ask you is where were you, uh, okay. and what were you doing on January 6th when this. <laughs> so this is another thing. My wife and family and I happened to fly to, fl we hadn't been anywhere. We were stuck in our homes like you were for eight months. And we decided to fly to Florida with masks on and protected. And we had the shields. First time we traveled, January 6th. And we'd landed around 3 p.m. And my phone is blowing up. Texts, emails, phone calls. Several, several of them are from Chris Liddell and others in the Biden team. And I landed and I said, what the heck is going on? We had no idea. And then I realized how bad it was. Actually, it wasn't until we got to the place where we were staying, we were staying in an Airbnb, that we turned on the TV and my jaw dropped. And that's when our work began to try to put pieces back together again and keep the transition process going as hard as it was. That was also an important day because that was the day where the Georgia runoff occurred and that's when it was determined that the two Democratic senators from Georgia won 
maintaining the democratic control of the Senate. And that allowed the Senate to get organized to start to process Biden's nominees. But Biden, as a result of all of this chaos, was very slow to get his Senate confirmed officials in place, the top people in each agency. And as you know, from running organizations and being involved in organizations like Georgetown, having your leadership team in place is the most important thing to be effective. So let me give you a little data here. A new president has the right to appoint an obligation to appoint 4,000 officials. 1,250 of them need to be confirmed by the Senate, 1,250. At day 100, call it April 1st, Biden only had 44 people in. At day 200, call it October 1st, he only had 127 Senate confirmed officials in. And so, you know, this is one of the problems with the, with the American transition is it takes too long to get people in place and Congress, and there should be changes to make it easier for a new president to get their people in place quickly. Wow. That's, that's incredible. So obviously, well, I mean, you, you've written a book and, and talked about some of the history in the book. Um, it, 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 this, can we say that this most recent transition, um, was the most fractured one in history or, or no? Uh, so actually in the book, we debate that very subject with some eminent historians like Ken Burns and, uh, Ted Widmer and Eric Rauschway, who are experts on Lincoln um, and Roosevelt. The worst transition, I think there's consensus among experts, was Buchanan to Lincoln. Uh, seven states seceded. The country was fractured over slavery. The Civil War was about to start. Buchanan, who was the sitting president during this four-month period when Lincoln was way out in Springfield, Illinois, not being able to communicate, um, Basically, half the Buchanan cabinet expressed their loyalty to the South. Jefferson Davis was elected during the transition as the president of the Confederacy. The country fell apart. So that was the worst. There is a debate over whether what the second worst was. And that debate is really between 1932 to 1933 and, and 2020. So in 1932-1933, the Great Recession was happening during the period when Roosevelt, uh, after the election and before the inauguration, four month period, Roosevelt was inaugurated on March 5th of 1933. During that period, the Great Depression peaked. We had bank runs and failures in, in half the states, 25 states. Hitler came to power. The Reichstag burned. Japan pulled out of the League of Nations starting their imperial march. And Hoover would not cooperate with Roosevelt, much like Trump did not want to cooperate with Biden. So that was a bad transition. So Ken Burns, the eminent historian and filmmaker, I interviewed him twice for the book, once in the summer uh, of the election and once after January 6th. And during the summer of the election, Ken said, what's a miracle is that if you look back, there have been 233 years since George Washington handed the reins to John Adams. And in that period, presidents have not wanted to go, but they've gone. No troops have been alerted. No shots have been fired. No Americans died. So I called him up after January 6th and I read him that statement. And I said, troops have been alerted. Arms have been raised and Americans have died during a presidential transition. And Ken said, we are in unprecedented territory with this transition. It is one of the worst moments in history. And that's Ken Burns, who just put out a film about the Holocaust. I mean, he knows a lot of bad parts of history. Oh, he definitely does. Um, he's been chronicling American history for a generation. <laughs> uh, and, and that's what really David kind of set America apart, it didn't. It? I mean, you know, obviously America has its its issues, but uh, I, there aren't very many other countries, if any at all, where we have the longest unbroken streak of any uh, right. country in uh, any de democratic country on earth. So we should celebrate that. Right. But we also need to make transitions smoother, better. They should be a nonpartisan affair. Uh, the outgoing should respect the will of the American people, and should. Um, 
support the transition. Actually, you know, I'm a Democrat. This right. was a nonpartisan affair. The best transition in history was actually George W. Bush to Barack Obama. Obama was very organized, had a good team uh, led by John Podesta and was ready to go. George W. Bush had another shortened transition. You remember Bush v. Gore uh, right. wasn't decided until December 13th of yeah. 2000. So he only had 30 days and he didn't get his people in place, particularly in national security positions. Eight months after he was president, 9-11 happened and he didn't have his people in place. Right. And the 9-11 commission did an autopsy of what had happened on that day and, and basically concluded that the shortened transition imperiled Bush's ability to get his people in place in the national security positions, and that undermined national security readiness. So fast forward seven years, Bush was burned by this. And he said, whoever the next president is, whether it's Obama or McCain, I want to roll out the red carpet for him. And he worked, he had Josh Bolton, his chief of staff, work with both the Obama and the McCain campaigns on a fair, equal, nonpartisan basis. Bush was supporting McCain, of course, as a, you know, he's a Republican, but he wanted to prepare whoever it was to be ready. And that was actually prescient because during the transition, we not only were in the midst of two wars, one in Afghanistan and one in Iraq, but we also had the financial crisis. And unlike the Hoover to Roosevelt transition, where the lack of cooperation deepened the Great Recession, extended it, caused more Americans to starve and die and lose their houses. In this case, collaboration between outgoing Bush and incoming Obama eased the financial crisis, created a sense of confidence in our government to react and allowed Obama to get his policies in place and his people in place faster enabling economic recovery to move much more quickly and much more deeply. So George Bush actually gets credit for creating the gold standard of, of presidential transitions and cooperating with, with President Obama. And, and you mentioned there's some other things that should be more codified, but there were some things codified from that Bush-Obama transition, correct? That's right. Actually, Josh Bolton uh, did a great job. He was the chief of staff and what he did creating processes, requiring tape, uh, briefing books, he required a, a, uh, kind of tabletop exercise, they call it, which basically a role playing or scenario playing uh, situation between the outgoing national security team and the incoming national security team of Bush and, and Obama. And all of that was put into law. All of that is now mandated by law. Uh, I'll give you one other story, which is a incredible story of why this is so important. In early January, all the Bush national security people, so this was Condoleezza Rice and others, met with the incoming Obama national security team. So Hillary Clinton, um, Jim, General Jim Jones, et cetera. And they s basically spent four hours game playing. What happens if there's a terrorist attack in the United States? How do we handle it during this period of vulnerability when there's one outgoing and one on incoming. And at 12.01 on uh, January 20th, Bush is out and Obama's in and our adversaries know this. On January 19th, so it kind of created this connective tissue and muscle memory and collaboration among the outgoing and the incoming, very patriotic work. On January 19th, the intelligence agencies of the United States had credible evidence there was going to be a terrorist attack on the mall by some Somali immigrants, um, militants against Obama and the inauguration. And the Bush team and the Obama team went to the Situation Room, spent hours and hours and hours planning what, how do we prevent it? And what happens if we're attacked? Because you have this period of vulnerability and they were working together in the best interest of the United States. And I give both Bush and Obama credit for this. You know, Bush was a highly unpopular president. His ratings were in the 20s and 30s when he left office. Obama ran his campaign basically against how terrible Bush was. Nevertheless, they did what was good for the country. They worked together, even though they didn't love each other. Um, they were political opponents. And they did what was right for a country, despite differences despite different parties and despite some animosity between the two teams. The thing that's most timely about the book is that you actually discuss 
some recommendations going forward to yeah. make e things even run more smoothly. Tell us about those. So we recommend in the book a number of changes. So first and foremost is making it easier for a new president to get his or her people in place. That's the most important thing. A new leader can't operate if they don't have their team in place. And so there are too many positions that require Senate confirmation and the Senate, sh the Congress should remove a lot of those positions, allowing the new president to get in more quickly. There should be more authority vested in career officials to take away kind of political operatives impeding uh, a transition of power. So we saw in the Trump transition that, you know, the political teams and various agencies just didn't want to cooperate with Biden. And that's not appropriate. That's not acceptable. So if you vest more authority with career officials, you eliminate the risk of political uh, problems. And then also more funding and moving up deadlines earlier so that a president elect can have more support, more, a larger team and do more planning. The more planning a new president can do in advance, the smoother the transition is going to, is going to take place. Are you finding um, an, an audience that's open to some of these reforms as a res result of what just happened? Yes. My sense is that there is a strong bipartisan uh, level of support for making transitions smoother and um, easier and faster. You know, there is a contingent of those that are very loyal to President Trump that you know, continue to believe the election was flawed and the transition was perfect. So, but that's, I think, a minority group, but that they, they hold those views very strongly. This has been an area of traditional nonpartisanship, the tradition about excellence in government and about a smooth handoff, um, supporting our democratic norms. And I'm hopeful and optimistic that we can get back to that nonpartisan approach to transitions. And to be clear, it, 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 the improvement in the reforms, that comes from Congress? Some of it comes from Congress and some of it comes from uh, the executive branch. I'll give you That's another example. Okay. President Clinton in, 19, in, in the year 2000, when there was a dispute over Bush v. Gore, who was going to become president, it was bitterly divided. You remember that period. And there was a sitting vice president running for president, Al Gore. Nevertheless, President Clinton said, I'm going to provide intelligence briefings to Governor Bush, even during the disputed election, because if he is president, I don't want him to be president, but if he becomes president, I want him to be ready. Trump did not authorize those intelligence briefings for Biden during the transition. That should be mandatory. Um, they should actually get those as a candidate. So there's so much you can do to help a, a candidate become ready uh, to become president-elect. It's the largest, most complicated job in the world. And frankly, nobody's ready. They're doing the best they can, but there, there are reforms and institutional uh, support that can be provided to help a new president be as ready as possible. If one other area um, in, in terms of this process, uh, what about what we... And does, I guess, does this touch transition or does transition have anything to do with this? I mean, now obviously the former president is under investigation for what he took from the White House. So I'm wondering if, if the transition process addresses that at all, has it in the past and, and should it? It does. And in the okay. law, there are briefings that are required about appropriate management of presidential records and classified documents. And we spent a lot of time on that during the transition because we were worried exactly about this issue. That documents would not be saved, documents would be destroyed, and documents would be taken. We had no idea that it would be the extent of this with boxes and boxes. But yes, I mean, there's a law and there are requirements under that, and that's why Trump is being investigated. Folks, so uh, we invite you to check out this book. Uh, and this is someone who's got a significant amount of experience uh, with this as he just most recently was a director of the Center for Presidential Transition at the Nonprofit Partnership for Public Service. The book, The Peaceful Transfer of Power and Oral History of America's Presidential Transitions 
and some interviews with some folks also who were very well um, uh, voiced in this area, including Ken Burns. Uh, we're happy to have had you on, my friend. Congratulations on the book. And everybody, please check it out, The Peaceful Transfer of Power. Thank you, David Marchick. Thank you, sir. Thank you for what you do, and thanks for having me. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. As always, perform an act of kindness on behalf of an elder or young person. Write a letter to a sister or brother who just so happens to find her or himself incarcerated. Offer libations to the ancestors upon whose sturdy shoulders we all now stand. And above all, give thanks to the God of your understanding by whatever name you call her and him. All God asks of us is that we give each other love. Thanks for giving MIP love. And please remember to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain.